morning to us. We would love to know that you're here. So my name is Michael Gross. I'm lead pastor here of Quarry, one of the pastors. And uh, it's, it's really a privilege to be able to share with you and to share from God's word today. I want to make one more announcement. Um, and I didn't give this one to Adam intentionally because I just want to share with you. So, so uh, this Sunday or today, we kind of step into Holy Week. Right, this week as we kind of move towards towards Easter, celebrating celebrating the cross, that horrible and glorious cross, and then and then also uh, an empty tomb and and the life that we have and the grace that that's there because of what Jesus did. And now you'll notice that this this year we're not we're not celebrating together Good Friday. Typically we come together on on Good Friday, but but because of COVID. And because of where we are as a church, as we're trying to move everything around, we just said, you know what, uh, something's, something's got to give. So we're not going to celebrate that together. Uh, we're not going to come together. Typically, we'd come together and we'd have communion together and we would, we would pray together. But we're going to ask that you guys do that in, in your homes. And then we're going to come together starting on Saturday we have, we, where we're going to invite the community uh, with us and then on Easter to celebrate the greatness of our God. So that's what's coming, that's what's coming this week. All right, so uh, together, we have been on this journey for the past 40 days, right? We've, we've called this thing the, the Red Letter Challenge, where we are reading the letters, uh, the, the words of Jesus, those, those words that are typically highlighted. If you have a physical Bible, they're often highlighted in red. But we're not just, we're not just reading them, we're, we're, we're doing them. And so, how's that been going for you? How, how has the 40-day challenge, if you're online, how has the 40-day challenge been, been going for you? Were you that, did you guys, did, did anyone here like, like check off all 40, 40 days? And you're like, yep, I nailed that thing. Man, I was, it was awesome. You know, and if that's you, way to go. That, way, way to go. And I, wanna, I really do want to celebrate that. Uh, you know, too often we don't, we don't celebrate. We don't stop and go, oh, we just did that together. But today's that day where we celebrate. Way to go. Or, or maybe, maybe you didn't do all 40, but, but you hung in there, you know, and you, you did like three in a row, and then you took a day off, and then you, oh, but I'm back in, and, and you, you, but you made it through to the end, and if that's you, way to go. You, we, we can celebrate. Don't let, don't let Satan steal your joy in, in the middle of this thing. See, he, here's, here's my hope, right, and the reason that we really embarked on this challenge in the first place is I believe that Jesus really is the only hope in our world. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus is the only way for us to have a right relationship with our Heavenly Father, with God. He is the answer to our hopelessness, the reason that we have purpose and the payment for my sin and the power to live in this life. It's because of Jesus that you and I, that, that I have that breath, that I live, that I exist in this moment, and the promise is that I get to exist with Him for all eternity, to live. He is life. And when we receive Him as leader and rescuer, He quite literally changes everything. And because Jesus changed everything for me, because He continues to walk with me, to hold me, and to re refine me, to forgive me, because His mercies are new every single day, I am compelled to tell you about Jesus. And together, we are called, we are commissioned to tell the world about Jesus, about God's love. And so, my hope for the Red Letter Challenge is that these past 40 days will serve as a catalyst, engaging the flywheel of your soul, right? Creating a sustainable rhythm so that you might continue to grow in intimacy with Jesus and be highly contagious, I mean virulent, like, like a real pandemic, sharing the glory of Christ with people around you for, for all the life that you have. As disciples of Jesus, that word disciple, as disciples of Jesus, there needs to be a shift in our life, kind of away from, from these 40-day challenges into a, a lifestyle of discipleship. There needs to be a shift. So over the, the past 20 months or so, 
my, my wife and I have made some significant changes in our lifestyle. And one of the most obvious is that we work out together, like, like right, I think five, five days a week. And she'll do even more than that, but for me, it's just five. You know, but it's every single week, and we, we do this together. Now, let me give you a little context, because I would say this. I would say that I've worked out my entire adult life. I've, I've, I've tried to maintain some sort of, of <laughs> physical uh, uh, shape. But I've done it, maybe like a lot of you, I've done it a little sporadically. Like, like I'm in for a while, and then I'm out for a while, and then I'm back in for a while, and then I'm out for a while. And I typically would do this in like 60 to 90 day increments. You know, I'd set a goal. Like some of you set goals, like, man, I need, to, I need to lose that 20 pounds. And so you engage that, you get after it, you, you kind of, you hit the mark, or maybe come close enough, and then you break off, right? And then you, you, you take your break. Or maybe you do something silly, like sign up to run a marathon. And you think to yourself, like I thought to myself, well, maybe I should actually prepare to run a marathon. And so you enter into a period of, of training, and you make it to race day, and then you cross that finish line, and then you hang up the running shoes, and you say, I'm not doing that again. You know, maybe I'll use those for mowing the grass, but that's about it. Or someone asks me to, to join them in the latest Tony Horton 90-day workout plan. And I'm like, all right, I'm in. I'm in 90 days. I can do, you can do anything for 90 days. But after 90 days, we're done. It's, o- it's over. See, for me, working out until this last period of my life has really kind of been a little bit of a roller coaster ride. A little on again and then off again. And for many of us, if, if we're honest, following Jesus has kind of been like that. It's been a bit of a roller coaster. Like, like, like we chase after him for a time and we experience some real growth and it's, and it's, and it's amazing. Like, like when we do a 40-day challenge and it's, it's pretty cool. But then when the 40-day challenge is over, we take a break. And that kind of up and down relationship with Jesus, it, it might work for a little while, but after a time, it just, it leaves us wanting. I mean, honestly, it leaves us, it leaves us empty. I mean, w- wanting more, wanting something else, wanting to just be done, wanting to be out. And so, as we wrap up the Red Letter Challenge, I want to encourage you to consider your relationship with Jesus more as a lifestyle than a series of sprints. Instead of coming in and out of of intimacy and really not gaining any significant ground, let's commit to making a shift. Let's make being a disciple who we are, a, a, a lifestyle, and watch God change you a little bit at a time as you are consistent in staying close with Jesus. And so, so what might this look like for you? I mean, in real time, practically speaking. Well, it's so good. Uh, God doesn't leave that question out there, right? He answers it for us. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Acts. It's, it's that book right after the last of the Gospels, the fifth book of the Bible at the New Testament. And we're going to look at one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. One of my favorite passages, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And let's take a look at what a lifestyle of following Jesus looks like for those, those early disciples, those first followers. Before we get there, uh, let, me, let me pray and we'll invite God into our time and let Him do what He needs to do with us today. All right, Heavenly Father, Oh, thanks for the breath that we have, Lord. This moment is a gift from you, God, and we praise you and we thank you that you are here with us. God, would you, would you meet us in this time? We, we want to talk about what it is to follow you, God, but we want to do more than that. We actually want to put this into practice. And so, Lord, I, just ta- I pray that you take down barriers that we have in front of us right now. Um, that you allow us to hear clearly from you and and, and that, God, you would compel us to take steps with you, God, whatever that looks like for for us as individuals, Lord, and for us as your body, as your church. Meet us in this time, God, whether we're online or we're here in person, meet us in this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So there, there's a story of a guy named D.L. Moody who, in the 19th century, man, he was kind of the guy. Uh, he, he was a, a, a preacher, someone who loved to tell people about Jesus. He, he was visiting a well-known Chicagoan when the conversation turned to involvement in the church. It turned, to, it turned to what it meant to be a part of the body. And so midway through this conversation, the man who Moody was talking to says, you know what, I believe that I can be just as good of a Christian outside of the church as I can be inside of the church. And, and maybe, maybe you felt like that, right? Because this is, this is a Western thought, that I, I really don't need to be a part of the body. It's just me and Jesus, and so in that moment, Moody held his tongue, and then moving over to a nearby fireplace, the fire raging against the winter outside, he, he took the poker and he pulled out one ember, a burning coal. He pulled it out of the fire and he put it right on the hearth. And there he sat with the other man and they just watched as that ember slowly lost the fire and turned from red hot to, to black coal. It got cold. The fire went out. And I, and I wonder just, just how many people have walked away from the church for what they thought were good reasons, only to find out that, that what they were really looking for could only be found in that people that, that they left, that they kind of pushed away. See, one of the challenges we have as people who seek to follow Jesus, is that so many of us, we, we live with a loose connection to the body, to, to the church. I mean, we, we think, a oh, church is nice and all, you know, but I really, don't, I really don't need it. Or what we're saying is, I really don't need them. And besides, have you been to a church? I mean, a church is full of messed up people. I mean, they're hypocrites and racist and they're greedy and they're immoral and they're, they're slothful and they're full of pride and every other sin that we can think of. And so, so it seems in those moments that it's much easier just to stay away or at least have a really good exit strategy. See, part of our problem is that we misunderstand the very nature of what it is to be a church and its role in discipleship. And how we talk about church is a dead giveaway. You know, we, we talk about going to church, kind of like, kinda like we, we go to the mall or we, we go to someone's house or we go to the market. A, a, a church is a place that we visit and then we leave rather than the living body of Christ that Paul talks about in his letters to the emerging church of the first century. See, for those first disciples the followers of Jesus, they, they didn't talk about going to church, they talked about being the church, that they were the church together. They were committed to each other and the mission that Jesus had called them to. Church wasn't simply another, another self-improvement plan, like, like how can the church make me better? It was God's save the world strategy that Jesus invited these followers to enter into together. It's, it's the being together, the doing life together, the ministering in our diversity, each one bringing a needed, unique gift. This is, this is a major underlying theme of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We do it together, or we are something other than Christians. See, as, as we look at the reading from Acts 2, I, I want to add this little caveat. See, there, there's a tendency for us to idealize or, or to romanticize the early Christians who, who comprised the church, to kind of look back through rose-colored glasses and speak of it with, with bated breath as if there was, there, was nothing, there was nothing tainted in that church. But then we miss the reality, the hypocrisies and the rivalries and the immoralities that troubled the early church just like they trouble the church today. These were just normal men, normal women, who were un questionably renewed and empowered by the Holy Spirit for the purposes of the Jesus mission. And Acts 2 is a description, not, not necessarily a prescription, but a description of the church. And it gives us clues as to what might lie ahead for those of us who are ready to make this shift into a lifestyle 
called discipleship. So a little context. What we're about to read, Acts 2, 42 through 47, it, it took place shortly after Jesus ascended into heaven, right? He died this horrible death on the cross. He rose in victory, defeating death. And then, and then he went and he hung out with his followers. Hey, guys. And he loved them and he taught them and he encouraged them until the time came when he went to be with the Father. But he said, hold on, hold on, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you one. He's, he's going to come, just hold on. You, you, it will be unmistakable when it happens, when the Holy Spirit comes. And it was unmistakable. And this, this is really the result of what happened when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. We see what it is to be a group of Jesus people. We read this, that they were, they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Reverential awe came over everyone. I love that. And many wonders and miraculous signs came about by the apostles. They were, they were empowered to do these things. All who believed were together and held everything in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and distributing the proceeds to everyone as anyone had need. Every day they continued to gather together by common consent in the temple courts, breaking bread from house to house, sharing their food with glad and humble hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And who wouldn't want to be a part of that? A lot of people want to be a part of that. And the Lord was adding to the number every day. Those who are being saved. Let, let, let's, let's take this apart just a little bit, all right? And, and try to apply it for those of us who are trying to make this shift into discipleship. What, it, what, what does it mean to enter into this lifestyle of discipleship? Well, verse 42 gives us a clue. It says that they were devoting, right? They were really focused on the apostles' teaching and, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They, they devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles. So the, so the they there, the they, the they that we're talking about were, were these early disciples. These were studying people. They were a learning church, Right? They, were, they were ravenous and they, they were going after understanding and, and knowing this is, this is so important to us. Right? Be, because you, you could say that in that moment when the Holy Spirit came, He empowered those, those early followers to, to open this, this school in Jerusalem. I mean, this, this spiritual school. And Jesus appointed the teachers. They, they, were, they were apostles. And there were no fewer than, than 3,000, we read this in verse 41, there were no, there were no fewer than, than 3,000 spiritual kindergartners who entered that school that day. And these spiritual, sp spirit-filled additions, they weren't just enjoying this mystical experience where they kind of checked their brains at the door. We read that they actually devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostle. They, they sat at the feet of those appointed by Jesus to be teachers they, they submitted themselves to the, the authority which was authenticated to them by the, the miracles that the apostles were doing. And so, so if you and I, oh, how do we apply this? If you and I were, were going to get off the roller coaster of nominal Christianity, then we need to be a people devoted to the teachings of the apostles. And, and plainly, that, that means that we need to become students of the Bible with a focus on that last half, the New Testament. And now in that statement, I'm not discounting the Old Testament, not at all. We, we need the Old Testament. It, it really colors everything for us and gives us a bigger picture. But we start with the New Testament because these books contain the teachings of the apostles. See, when the, when the early church came together to determine which writings actually belong in, in what we call the, the New Testament, this was somewhere around the middle of the third century, the major test was if that writing was authored by an apostle. That was the litmus test. Now, now some of you are, are thinking, because you know a little bit about this, and you, you, you think, well, well, hold on, what about Mark? Mark wasn't an apostle. What, 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 about, what about Luke? We're reading his book. He wasn't an apostle. Well, that, that's true. But, but these were people who sat with the apostles. The, there was a circle of apostleship here. They're, they're, they were connected. And so if you could say a book was apostolic in that way, then the church added it to what we call the canon of Scripture or, or the New Testament. 
And so a lifestyle of discipleship looks like people who study Scripture together, who take seriously the authority of the New Testament and, and seek to not just read those words, but to live those words out together. And so, so, so if you're, you're a parent, you actually, you actually teach this to your children. You walk with your family <clears throat> together. A, a, a disciple will, will read and reflect upon Scripture every single day in order that they grow in maturity in the relationship with Jesus. This is where the Spirit people of God, to submit to the, the Word of God. So we read that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to, and to fellowship. Now, now fellowship, that we, we, we take the Greek word koinonia and we translate it in, into fellowship. Ko, koinonia, you, you might hear that thrown around every once in a while in, in Christian circles. We, we like to speak Greek every once in a while just to make us feel good. But, but it's interesting because the, the word actually comes from the adjective koinos, which means common. So Christ speaks to what we have in common as his people, what we share as Christian men and women, fellowship. So as, as followers of Jesus, we have in common the grace of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We, we may come from different neighborhoods, different cultures, different nations, different denominations, but we are unified by the grace of God. Don't forget the grace of God, the grace that he extended through his son, Jesus Christ. That grace is the glue that holds us together. That grace is what compels us to the world. But this idea of, of koinonia, of what we have in common, it also speaks to what we share outwardly. Not only what we receive together, but, but what we give together. Acts 2.44 says this, All who believed were together, and they held everything in common. Coin us. And they began selling their property and possessions and distributing the proceeds to everyone as anyone had need. <laughs> now this is one of those passages where we, we squirm a little bit in our seats. It's, one, it's, it's a passage that we typically kind of jump over and we hurry on to the next verse, kind of avoiding the challenge that is in that passage. But in this moment, let's devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching here. Is that passage prescriptive or descriptive? I mean, does every spirit-filled believer have to follow that example Literally, does, does it mean that we should all sell everything we own and give the proceeds to the poor? Some Christians throughout history have, have believed that and, and done exactly that. They've been, they've been called to that. In fact, Jesus, if you remember the story of the rich young ruler, it's, it's found in the Gospels. It, it, Mark 10 is an example. He was called by Jesus to do that. Jesus, he, he asked Jesus, what, what do I have to do? To enter the kingdom. And he said, man, for you, what I want you to do is I, I want you to sell everything you have. He's a rich dude. I want you to sell everything you have and I want you to give it to the poor. And then, and then you can come follow me. Francis of Assisi, Middle Ages, he followed this call. Mother Teresa and her, her sisters of charity, they, they took this vow of, of poverty. They did exactly that same thing. And, and this really is meant to teach us, as, as Jesus put it, that, that human life does not consist in the abundance of our possessions. It is so much more than that. It's not about gathering a bunch of stuff. But, but the absolute prohibition of private property, this is not a, a Christian doctrine. That's a Marxist doctrine. So when we come to, story, to the story in particular of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, if you know their story, they, uh, they sold their, their property, right? And then, they, and then they come, and they come before, before Peter, for the apostles, and they say, here's, here's my gift. And uh, we're, we're bringing the whole sale in. And then in minutes, they both drop dead. And it's like, what happened there? Is it because that they, they, didn't, they didn't bring the whole thing? Because they... They, they didn't bring the whole gift. They only brought part of the gift, but they actually wanted credit for the whole gift. It's not because they didn't bring the whole thing in that there was consequences. It's because they lied about what they did. They lied to the apostles. They lied 
They lied to God. Peter, Peter says to them in Acts 5, he said, before it was sold, did it not belong to you? God gave that to you, right? And when it was sold, was the money not at your disposal? That was yours, right? And that, that's exactly true. God gives us the freedom to choose how we will best honor him with what he gives us. He doesn't mandate that we give it all over, but sometimes he asks that of us. See, not, not everybody in Jerusalem gave everything away. Verse 46 says that, that they met in one another's homes. So evidently, some people still had their homes. So the giving and selling, these are, these are voluntary. They were voluntary then, and that's the way it should be today. And so, I'm not going to tell you to sell everything you own and give it to the poor. So you can breathe a little deeper. But God might ask that of you. It's not the life of every Christian, but it's the life of some but here's what we know about those early Christians. They tangibly loved one another. I mean, they, they cared for the poor sisters and brothers who were less fortunate than them. I actually believe that this was the first time in human history where there were no poor in a specific group of people because they took care of one another. They shared their goods. They, they shared their homes. So if we're going to shift towards a lifestyle of discipleship, then those of us who live with much, as you and I do, we live with much, we really need to simplify our lives. I mean, creating economic margin, creating time margin. It's really not about creating a, a list of do's and don'ts that are mandatory for everybody, a generalization of musts and must-nots. We have to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit and create margin so that so that we can be more generous in our care for the poor and in our giving to the cause of Christ. See, a disciple of Jesus is generous because our God is a generous God. I mean, just imagine, imagine with me the power of our collective witness if we all together determined to live below our means. I mean, instead of at the very top of our means. And then we, we blessed our neighbors here. And, and we blessed people around the world with God's abundance. Who wouldn't want to be a part of that? They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So, so the breaking of bread here is a little bit misleading because you read that and we think it's, it's maybe talking about a regular meal, but, but there's this hint that maybe it's something more, and it really is something more. This is a specific reference to, to what we call the Lord's Supper or, or communion, the, this, this time where we, we remember the gift of the cross by, by breaking bread together, by, by eating and remembering what Jesus has done for us. And we do that together with other believers. And now when Luke here mentions prayer, he's not talking about private prayer. This is, this is more of a corporate setting, a, a togetherness, the prayer of God's people together. So really, communion and prayer here define worship. We understand that the early church, they still met in, in the temple setting. There, there was a, 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 a formal gathering but they also participated in informal gatherings that took place in homes. Verse 46 says, Every day they continued to gather together by common consent in the temple courts. That's the more formal setting. But then we read about this, that they were breaking bread from house to house, sharing their food with glad and humble hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. It's painting a picture for us of what, what this could look like. And in, in, in the quarry, we, we try to replicate that as best we can. Maybe, maybe you've heard it said that there are two main engines at the quarry as, as a people, right? Sunday morning worship where we, we come together in, in a formal setting like this, and then there are our access groups or our smaller groups. But we say that both of these are critical elements to your spiritual growth. 
We need that formal setting where we, where we all focus in on a common teaching and a common direction and we, we work at being one body moving together. But we also need these smaller groups of people where we really do life with one another, which can't happen in a setting like this, where we, we talk in depth about Scripture, not just, not just me talking at you, but us talking together, where we refine each other, we're vulnerable with each other, we encourage one another, we, we laugh together and we cry together and we pray with and for one another. L- l- listen, th- those early disciples, they, they, didn't, they didn't go to the church. I mean, they, they, they were the church. They lived church. Just, just, like, just like we're the church. Every day. E- every, every day. And now we can get into arguments about, well, well, it was such a different time, and of course they could do it every day. And we, we, I'm, Maybe we don't have to do it every day, but there needs to be consistency. There needs to be a rhythm. See, when, when meeting together with other believers becomes a part of your normal rhythm, God begins to form you in a way that does not happen in isolation. You actually start to heat up because you're, you're connected to the fire, right? You start to turn red hot. And friends, we need this. If, if you're simply attending church, taking in information, be it, be it online or, or in person, but you're missing out on that life-on-life life experience with other believers, you might be learning from God, and God can use that to change you. But you are missing out on, on the beauty and the power and the design of what it means to follow Jesus. There is no discipleship in isolation. And so... Make a shift. Right? Get off the roller coaster, that, that low return investment of a maverick faith, and instead in, invest in others while they in, invest in you. So, so we, we've taken a little bit of time and we've really focused intently on, on Acts 2.42. On that one verse. And there's, there's so much there. Literally millions of sermons have been preached on Acts 2.42. But if we only stayed in that, in that one passage, our, our picture of what comes next for us, this lifestyle of discipleship, it would really be unbalanced. And we, we need balance. Verse 42 speaks only of a disciple as one who worships, who gives, and studies. But the, but the why behind that, the mission to what God has called us to together... That isn't addressed until we come to verse 47 of the passage. See, in verse 47 we read that the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. And if you, if you read into that, you, you, you see that there, there was a saving that was necessary. Right? That there, there's a mission that his disciples are called to. Verse 47 shows that, that God does something in and through the disciple. He, he multiplies in and through the disciple. Now, now notice straight away, that this is the Lord who's doing it. We read that the Lord, the Lord was adding to their number. God, God does this through the preaching of the apostles and through the telling of, of the ordinary disciples and, and through their shared life of love. But he does this because only he can do this. Through the Holy Spirit, he can give sight to the blind. He, he can... He can bring hearing to the deaf, life to the spiritually dead, adding them to his church. And God allows us, just you and me, ordinary people, to join him in this great mission. And he gifts us, and he employs those gifts for his ultimate glory. And it's by his power that we become disciples who make disciples. By his power, we become multipliers. And the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. He, he does those two things together, saving and adding. The saving and the adding, they, they happen simultaneously, right? He, he, doesn't, he doesn't save anyone without adding them to his people. He doesn't save them into isolation. He saves them into the body, into his body. And he he does these two together because salvation and belonging, being part of a greater whole, they always go together. 
every day. Day by day, he added to their number those who are being saved. See, the life of a disciple isn't lived in isolation. But if, if they're adding to the number day by day, it, it, it speaks to us. And it says that it's also not solely lived in the presence of other disciples. Evidently, they're rubbing shoulders with people who are outside the kingdom of God. The, the early church, those followers of Jesus, they were a beacon of light in a world of darkness. They, they, they lived in the world, even though they were not of the world. And so, so what might that look like for you, disciple, Jesus follower, to be light in this world? Well, who do you know? Who do you know who needs a Savior? How, how, can, you, how can you bless him? How can you bless her? How can you enter into their life? How can you exhibit love to them? Maybe you can start by, by simply praying for them, by being present for them. For, for some of you, you're asking, you're asking that question, and, and it just keeps going around. Who do I know who's not a follower of Jesus? Who do, who do I know? And, and the answer is you're not sure you know anyone who's living far from Jesus. And so my question to you is how do you break out of that bubble you're, you're stuck right now, and you need, you need to break out of this. What, what has to shift in your life so that you come into contact with people who are far from God? Because in order to be a part of a rescue mission, you need to be around those who need rescuing. It's our great privilege. So the Red Letter Challenge it concludes today. My hope is that these past 40 days, that they will be a catalyst, a, a stepping off point for you. That Acts 2, 42 through 47, that it might actually become your story, that you, 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 you're able to enter into that because this really is what's next for us, a lifestyle of discipleship, a person a person who studies, a person who, who worships, a person who gives, a person who multiplies. And so, so would you today, would you, would you step off? Would you, would you make that, that shift, that commitment to shift? And, and maybe you check every box every single day, but maybe you're like the rest of us and you'll do three in a row and then, ah, I had a bad day, but then you'll get back in and you'll keep checking boxes and you, you, you'll take steps as you stay close to Jesus. Commit to the shift. Break free from your 90-day cycle of on-again, off-again discipleship. Friends, the time is now. Really, the time is now. We need you. You, you need this. God is calling you. So with the Spirit of God in you, make discipleship, following Jesus, make it a lifestyle. Friends, there's no greater cause than the cause of Christ. There is no greater purpose than the purpose of Jesus. He's calling you.